who marries is alive. Yeah, so the child they have. The child they have is the deceased the brother, is the exact, is the deceased brother's soul. That's how he keeps his name. Okay. Yes, okay. So the, the class you're doing Sunday, do you plan to uh, podcast? I've been doing it. It's been up. You can go into Facebook. You can go into to Torch. It's been ongoing. We're on chapter uh, 9. You sent me an address, and the only thing I could get on it was the first class. Gosh, is that really so is okay? That we're gonna have to we're, we're gonna have to fix you up. Okay. It's not a podcast. I don't do. It's just a regular one of your regular classes. YouTube kind of thing. It's YouTube and Facebook. Rabbi Wolby puts it on the Facebook. Um, the Torch web Facebook. You need a direct email. Basically, what you need is like the link in an email that you click and it's there. You can't go searching. Yeah, I hear it's you. It's a scary thing out there. I hear Can you. Can I email you again? <laughs> you mean yes, today? Pardon? Can I email you and get it from you? Absolutely. I'll send you. I'll send you. Okay. What other days of the week do you teach? I'm just trying to get it where we are so that we're all on the right page, okay? Uh, we are on page 56A. 56A. Right there, right? I thought so, right? Right here, okay? Can I get a copy? Yes, everybody gets a copy. God willing, I think I have enough. 56A1. Mm -hmm. One second. Uh, yeah, okay, fine. Everybody else can turn the page. 56A1. Okay, I think that's enough for everybody. There you go. Testing, one, two, three, testing, one, two, three. Okay, we're on the dreams class. Okay, are we ready? Okay. This is from the Gomorrah in Brachot. It's a classic text that's always the place to start. In terms of the oral law, it went on for several pages in terms of what is the idea of dreams. And we've discovered that really from last week in the Marsha, just to get a little quick recap on it, okay? That, okay, where am I? Okay, got it, here. <clears throat> so we learned that there were three different types of dreams, okay? Right? So there was the first type of dream which has no single objective meaning. Okay? Almost like a, a floating potential. That it could have meaning if it gets interpreted. But if it doesn't get interpreted, it's bogus. Okay? So like a, they learn it as a unopened letter. A letter that you get. That you can open the letter. Or you could round file it. Okay? Does everybody know what round file means? That's right. Okay, or you can just put it in that drawer until Pesach time comes when you got to do it. Take care of it. Okay, and then there's the second type of dream, which consists of a vision. It does have a, a, a vision, okay, objectively speaking. It does have a particular portent, right? It has one basic meaning, either positive or negative in nature. However, even dreams in this category can be influenced by its interpretation. The interpretation can sway it this way or that way, okay? The positive meaning can be mitigated, right? Or perhaps reversed by a negative interpretation, okay? As we'll see. And then the third type of dream is one which has a true prophetic import, and that is what we have like we have with Joseph. Joseph who had a definitely prophetic dream, and that's boom, right? And you can't sway that one. By interpretation. So one is it's like totally floating, like, you know, who knows where that atomic particle is going to do. Is it going to be a wave or is it going to be a particle or then there's going to be a, no, it has a meaning and it could be good or it could be good, but it definitely has a weight on it. Okay. And then there's C. So now we discussed last time in terms of a very significant concept that we talked about that a basically if you think about it that day, right, that that's going to weigh in terms of your dream, okay? 
So as we have here, the examples that we're going to have right now, it is on 56A1, that we had, the idea was that, here, let's just read it. Okay, the, the Caesar, right, the Caesar. The Caesar said to Rabbi Yeshua, but Rabbi Hanina, the son of Rabbi Hanina, you Jews say that you are extremely wise. <laughs> I didn't know that Jews claimed that they were extremely wise. Okay, yes, we are wise, okay. Tell me then what I will see in my dream tonight. Well, that's like ahead of time, right? So you'd think you'd need prophecy for something like that. But of course, we have a phrase we have handed down. Chacham yoter minavi. Uh, a wise man is greater than a prophet. Bizarre. It's a lot to say about that. Why? Because if a wise man, if he knows what's to follow, you know, he can really be really more exact from the due to the formulation of patterns. He can follow, know what's going to happen. You know, a prophecy has to rely on is is he's going to get is the is he going to get plugged in or not to get the knowledge. But then, but the wise man, all the time, he can tell what things will follow. From A will follow B, from B to C, C to D. So how do you say? Uh, Hacham minavi. Okay, adif. Their language is actually Hacham adif, adif, which is also means more, more than a navi. Yeah, adif, which means adds, adds, uh, 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 I guess so, if, with an ayin, adif with an ayin. Okay, so he says, okay, Rabbi, tell me what I am going to see in my dream tonight. Okay, so he says, what will I see in my dream tonight? So Rabbi Yeshua said to him, in your dream, you will see that the Persians will press you into the service of their king. I think that is Iran. <laughs> okay. And they will seize you and force you to pasture unclean animals with a staff of gold. Okay, he gets a little picture here, right? In other words, you guys, you're going to be uh, watching pigs, Persian pigs, with a staff of gold. Okay? As it happened, the Caesar thought about this vision the entire day. That's an interesting idea. And at night, he actually saw it in a dream. So like, obviously, he says to the rabbi, Rabbi, you're amazing! You got it right! Okay? <laughs> So the Gomorrah mentions an incident that mirrors the previous one, just to get, just to knock it home a little bit. King Shapur, okay, who is King Shapur? He was an emperor of the Sassanid dynasty, whoever that is, a frequent adversary of Rome, okay? Not friends with Rome. That's what you got to know. He once said to Shmuel, you Jews say that you are exceedingly wise. She, I wasn't saying, I don't go around. I, I don't know. Some, but some Jew is going around saying, you know, we're, we're really wise. You know, I, I don't know who that guy is. We'll find him. Tell me then what I will see in my dream tonight. So Shmuel said to him, in your dream, you shall see that the Romans come and take you captive. And they shall force you to grind date pits with a golden mill. <laughs> okay. Let's go for the golden mill, not silver. Everything we're going for the, gold. and it's got, no, it's got to be date pits. Okay. Yeah. It's not going to be something else. It's you're going to grind date pits with a golden mill. A okay. There's deep mysteries in these that are so deep. Let me tell you about something. They teach about the esoteric wisdom of the Kabbalah and the Zohar and the deep text. And you go into worlds and you're learning about different dimensions and levels of soul. And they say, you know, they hid the deepest, deepest stuff in the stories of the Talmud. So deep that we have absolutely no clue what's going on. Nobody? But the idea really is, the good thing is, one day we will. But now that you have this information recorded in you, that when we go to that world, right, then we're going to say, oh, that's so awesome. That's what that meant. So in other words, when he's talking about grinding date, date pits in a golden mill, there's a deep metaphor to that. And there's a conversation going on between him and the king about dates and golden mills that is a different message that's being conveyed. Okay? But we're just going to ride the story for now instead of trying to get into that. What's the thing about date pits, Rabbi? Okay? Are and date pits edible if you grind them up? 
I guess so. They are now. I found out now. Okay, we think we got something here. You know, they grind apric apricot pits. Apricot pits. Really? Called latriel. Actually, it's supposed to be a very, very powerful remedy against cancer. They were doing it in New York. They were testing it in, what's the place called in New York? Sloan Catering. Okay. And there was a movie, Slo Catering. I thought it was Catering, okay. right? Sloan well, Catering. They do it right. Right. They were, they were, they were testing, a late, they called it Latriel. They had a new name for it, Apricot Bits. It's actually now it's called B17. I think it's B17. You cannot buy it here in this country. It is completely outlawed. You have to order it from Mexico. It comes in a powder because it is the same ingredient that they use for cyanide poisoning. Yeah, I was going to say, I know that. Yeah. But that's, of course, but, 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 no, apricot pits. I don't know about peach pits. They, because if you take an, a huge amount of it, then it yes, it is. It's true. It's going to have the they same, it's going to be cyanide poisoning. But what happens is, what they do is, there are people, there is, an, I forgot which country, they eat it all the time. They grind them and they eat them because they eat them, they're used to them. They've developed their, um, what do you call it? it intolerance. They developed a tolerance, so I was told, so they, when they tell you to take Latriel as an anti-cancer agent, you have to start off small. One pill in the morning, one pill in the day, and then you build up. You know, you wait a week, and then you build it up to two and two, and then you build it up, and then you have this unbelievable intolerance, and they have actually found that it does in many cases. Of course, I have to go into, a, I'm not taping this, because I can go off tape even though it's being recorded for those people live. You know, there's more people making money off cancer research than dying. So I don't know if they want a cure for cancer so much, okay? I don't know. Okay, I don't want to get into the conspiracy. I'm not a conspiracy dude, but let's go. I don't want to talk about it right now. Let's just go into date pits are edible, <laughs> but maybe date pits cannot be edible. I don't know. It's the first time I've heard this, but maybe there's some kind of nutritious value. Apricot pits ever. You can order it online, B17, but it's not made here. It can't be made here or sold in your uh, any of your stores there was a man who liked apple seeds they have a nice apple seeds have, have the same thing all seeds have this idea have this concept and uh, okay he used, every time he ate an apple he would eat the seeds for the pleasure of it and then he decided to get himself a special treat and he saved them up until he had a cup and then he ate them all at once and he died too much too much too much see it has the same Agents in them. Okay, fine. Very good. Anyways, okay, let's continue the story. So they shall force you to grind date pits and with a golden mill. As it happened, the king thought about this vision all the entire day. And at night, he actually saw it in his dream. Now, you have to understand, I have to introduce this proviso, okay? Because, you know, he thought about it the entire day. In other words, the, he gave the rabbi some weight, Okay. If it's just some guy at the 7-Eleven, right, while you're buying your bag of peanuts and he's buying his beer, you know, and he happens to sell it, he doesn't have much weight. You're not going to think about it all day. But the rabbi says something, just like what doctors do. People give weight to doctors. And when the doctor says X, people believe it. And then it happens, okay? Because a lot of this happens to do with it's in the head, okay? And this rabbi obviously injected this idea in the head, and this one injected that in the head, and the rabbi had some weight to it, so therefore, boom. Okay? Both they thought about it. So therefore, if you do think, yeah, well, I don't, you know, you got to think about it. There's a big thing about gold. Okay, now we're going to get into something big. Now, now we're getting into the story of Barhedia. This is going to be an amazing story, okay? That everybody knows this, all of the, those who read the Talmud and understand and, and go into the study of dreams get into Barhedia, okay? And there's gonna, we're gonna have a lot of questions and the more I read this and every time I do go over this, just more questions come up. But we just have to be quiet for right now and go forward, okay? Barhedia was an interpreter of dreams. The one who gave him payment for his services, Barhedia would interpret that person's dream auspiciously, which means it's good. For the But the one who did not give him any money, he would interpret that person's dream inauspiciously meaning no good abaya and rabba each dreamed the same dream and they approached barhedia to interpret it for them 
Now Abaya gave him a zuz as payment for the service. And Rava did not give him any money. Okay? And they both approached him. I don't know if it's the same time. I don't think Rava's going, here you go. And Abaya's going, no. Right? And they're right there sitting in the same room. Okay? And we're going to look at it as like they had an appointment. Right? <laughs> had to go through the we'll swipe the insurance card. No insurance. Don't need it. Wasn't done at that time. Okay? Different appointments. Private consultation. I had this dream. This guy gave money. This guy didn't. Okay? So they said to him in our, our dream that we read the following verse. Now the verses that they're going to bring are going to be amazing verses. Okay? Because really these verses come from uh, Deuteronomy. That in Deuteronomy, as all of the verses that follow, are all of the curses. There were 98 curses that were listed to the Jewish people if they don't listen do follow Torah and mitzvahs. Actually, they did follow Torah and mitzvahs. They didn't do it with joy. They did it with the wrong attitude. It's so unbelievable, like in Bechukosai that we have actually next week is going to be also a list of curses, right? But not as long. Way in Deuteronomy, there's 98 curses that are listed to the Jewish people. Terrible things. They have to read it in a room. When they read it in synagogue, they mumble and speed through it because, you know, it ain't cool. However, there's, I'll have to put this forward with a great um, story of the ba Lubavitcher Rebbe, right? Um, Lubavitcher Rebbe's son was in the synagogue every year. Lubavitcher Rebbe, this is the, the earlier one, not recent one in Europe. He would read through the curses, you know, and, and one, one week he had to be away. He couldn't make it to synagogue. He had somebody else lane, somebody else read from the Torah in the public reading on the Sabbath. He had somebody else read for it. And, of course, it was that week was the week of the curses, and the son passed out. During the curses, the son passed out. They had to carry him home, revive him. And when he woke up, they said, what happened? What's going on? What, you know, he says, the curses, the curses. I couldn't, I couldn't take him. I couldn't take him. And they said, we don't, wait a minute, listen, you're, you're not a young kid. This is not the first time you were in shul. You're an, old, you're an older person. You've learned, listened to the curses every single year. And how come this year you passed out because of the curses? He says, every year my father, when he read them, I saw them as blessings. <laughs> and this year someone else was reading them. It was too harsh. It was too harsh. Now we Let's go forward. So he says here, they both dreamed in a dream, your, your ox will be slaughtered from before your eyes, meaning the enemy, an enemy is going to come, they're going to take away every single thing from you, and your livestock will get to be slaughtered in front of you, and you're not going to eat it, they're going to eat it. Okay? So Lorava Amarle to Rava, what Barhedia said, this foretells that Pasid is kach, your business will fail. And on account of your heart's great sorrow, you will have no interest in eating it. Because the rest of the verse says, you're not going to eat it. Okay? In other words, it's going to be such, so, it's going to hit you so hard, dude, that you're not even going to want to eat. La Abaya to Abaya, he says, Marvach iskach, your business will profit. And on account of your heart's great joy, you will have no interest in eating. You'll be so happy. I don't, you just don't want to eat anything. Okay? So he took a, cur a, a verse of a curse and he interpreted it two different ways. Okay? The guy who gave him money was positive. So much blessing. Right? Right? And this is how he finagled it. Abai and Rava then recounted a further dream to Barhedia. By the way, it did happen to Rava. His business failed. Okay? And Abaya profited. Abai and Rava then recounted further a dream to Barhedia, and they said to him, In our dream, they read to us the verse that says, you will, you will bear sons and daughters, but they will not be yours, for they will go into captivity. Right? Not a good one. To Rava, Barhedia said, the verse pertains to you according to its original negative meaning, that is, your children will be taken from you by martyrs. People are going to come into the town, do a pogrom, and take away your kids. La Abaya Marle, however, to Abaya he said a more favorable interpretation, namely, your sons and daughters will be many, 
Your daughters will get married to husbands from other parts of the world. And since they will live so far away, it will seem to you as if they had gone into captivity. Okay, so you'll have a daughter who lives in Los in Beverly Hills. Okay. Okay, so it's like she's in a way in captivity because you're in Jerusalem and they're in Beverly Hills. Okay. Abaya and Rava relate a third verse they saw in a dream. Why did Rava ever tell him the second or third dream? Listen, I said keep the questions to the end. We've got questions. Let's just go through it and then we'll ask all. There's many questions. Okay. And if you want to write your questions down, gay gesund. Okay. They said to Bar Hedia, they read to us the following verse. Your sons and daughters will be given to another people. To Abaye, right? Bar Hedia said, this foretells that your sons and daughters will be many. And when the time comes to find marriage partners for them, you will say that they should be given in marriage to your relatives, right? Whereas your wife will say that they should be given to her relatives. Okay, one second. So given to another people. That's what it means by given to another people. Okay? Meaning relatives. Okay? And eventually, she will coerce you to comply with her wishes. And you will give them in marriage to her relatives. You're going to offer them to her side of the family instead of your side of the family. That's what it means by given to another people. Not your... Right? Because it's considered like another people. The Rava to Rava, he said what the verse mentioned, the verses mention of another people indicates that what? Your wife will die. Following which you will remarry and your sons and daughters will become, will come to the hands of another woman. Meaning the stepmother. Okay? That's pretty dire. Whoa. Okay, it gets worse. <laughs> Buckle your seatbelts, Dorothy. Okay? Bar Hedia quotes Rava's own teaching in support of his interpretation. For Rava himself once said, in the name of Reb Yirmiya Bar Abba, are we all there? Let's wait till we all get there. Right? This is Bar Hedia quoting this, okay? So he's a scholarly gentleman, of course. He reads Bible. He said in the name of Rav Yirmiya Bar Abba, who in turn said in the name of Rav, what is the meaning of that which is written, your sons and your daughters will be given to another people? This refers to a new wife of the father. Okay, so in other words, that was an interpretation, and he used that interpretation in terms of interpreting Rav's dream. Abai and Rav then said to Bar Hedia, in our dream, they keep coming back. I mean, it's amazing that Rav keeps coming back. Okay, like, dude, like, why, you know, or... No one gave him the stock tip. Give him a coin, dude. Right? No one gave him the stock tip. Um, you know? Or, you know, Barhedia, you know, if you give me some money, I think we can make thing make a deal. Okay? No. Abai and Rava then said to Barhedia, in our dream they used, they read to us the following verse, go, eat your bread with joy. Okay, this is a good verse. This is happy. Right? Lech echol b'simcha lachmecha. Okay, Abaya amarle. To Abaya, Barhedia said, this indicates that what? Your business will prosper and you will eat and drink in abundance. And in your heart's great joy, you will recite this verse, right? Of what? Echol b'simcha lachmecha. Lech echol b'simcha lachmecha. You'll say it. The, to Rava, however, he said, what? Your business will fail. You will slaughter meat, but will not have the appetite to eat or drink. And to mitigate your anxiety, you will recite this hopeful verse. Okay? Meaning the hopeful verse. This verse will not represent a reality for you, but a distant hope. While you are impoverished, you will recite it and pray that your lot will improve. Right? The Marsha adds it that... It was then the custom for people to recite this optimistic verse to those who experienced misfortune so as to console them and offer them hope for the future. I was reading the note there in 13. Yeah. A further dream is related. Abai and Rava said, in our dream, they... you got to wonder, obviously, and I'm sure you're wondering, what's going on here? 